This morning we're going to begin a new study. We're going to spend a season in the book of Titus, if you'll turn uh, to Titus, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus. So turn there, and I want to introduce this book to you this morning. When I ask people, what is their favorite book in the Bible, I can tell you this, I've never had one person say Titus. I'm hoping to change that. I hope by the time we're done that at least a dozen of you will say, Titus is my favorite book in the Bible. And just my early studies, it's already becoming one of mine. This is what is called a pastoral epistle. There are three of them recorded in the New Testament. We've got 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Those are the pastoral epistles. Most of Paul's letters were written to churches and regions and areas, except for Philemon. And so these letters, though, were written to to individuals who were leaders in the church. And these are instructions, then, that were given to Timothy and to Titus to encourage them and to give specific help in shepherding the church of God that they were being overseers for. So very specific instructions given to these men in shepherding the flock of God. And so thus, it's so pertinent information to the church of God. And I think it will prove to be very foundational for Southside Bible Church at this time in our journey together as a local assembly. Titus was a young man who was trained by Paul himself. He was a true leader of frontier missions and the strengthening of the churches. I want to give you a little bit of information about him as we begin studying this letter together. It's interesting to me that his name is never mentioned in the book of Acts, which limits us a little bit in placing when and how he comes on the scene in the early church. And so that part we don't have a lot of information on. It appears, though, that Titus was in a strategic leadership with Paul. Paul wanted to hand his work over as he sees his years coming to an end. He wants to hand over his ministry and all that he's been called by God to do. And Timothy and Titus are those men that he is handing the baton Two. Titus is mentioned twice in Galatians 2. Paul's going up to Jerusalem to have the apostles kind of check his gospel to make sure that he's preaching the true gospel. He just makes sure I'm not off. I don't want to run in vain. And when he goes up, he takes Barnabas and Titus with him. And as he goes, they, they try to compel Titus to be circumcised, which tells us he was a Gentile. Once he's mentioned in 2 Timothy, And then nine times he's mentioned in 2 Corinthians, which is quite interesting. When you think of the worst church in the New Testament, what usually comes to mind for you is it's Corinth. Corinth was a difficult, defiled place, and they had many problems in the church there. And Paul chooses Titus to be the key guy working in the Corinthian church. And many think he delivered the second letter from Paul, or he was just sent right after that letter. And so he is there to try to straighten out Corinth. 2 Corinthians 7, 6, Paul talks about being comforted by the coming of Titus. What comfort it brought to Paul when Titus was sent to come. God used Titus as a major player and leading leader then in getting Corinth back on track, which is an amazing calling and great task that Titus did. Well, now as we come to this epistle, he's on the island of Crete. And Crete is a church that was really struggling in, again, a nasty environment. There's false teachers and there's sin within. They were not a bright light to the society around them the way they should have been. And Paul is telling Titus, now I want you to fix, put in order what is broken. I want you to appoint elders in every church there in Crete. And it appears that Titus was kind of like, have you ever seen the TV show The Undercover Boss? Like he, he would come in and, and he would look and figure out what was wrong with the real difficult churches. And then Titus was kind of the guy that could fix them up. So the purpose of Paul's letter is to call the church back to doing what it should. To manifest the beauty of those who are joined to Jesus Christ and are to be a bright light in a dark society. And our country is darkening And this is the time where the church is going to shine like never before. And and same in Crete. In Crete, they, they need to put some things in order so that the name of Jesus Christ is put on display by this church. And so Paul is going to do this in this way. I'm going to give you just a broad outline. In chapter 1... He deals with the character and the conduct of the leaders. If the the leaders are foul, the whole thing is going to be off. 
And so let's begin with what a godly leader, what he should look like, what should be his characteristics and his abilities. Then he'll move to chapter 2, and he'll deal with the character and conduct of the members of the church. And we will look very specifically at discipleship and different areas that God wants the church to be functioning so that the light of Christ will be put on display. And then in chapter 3, he deals with the character and the conduct of the church's witness before the world. So his leaders, the church members, and then our testimony in the world is what uh, Titus is going to be commanded to put in order in the churches in Crete. So guys, we're living in a time when the church visible is beginning to look much like the society that we live in. The the church visible is beginning to, to conform to the world. And that's what we're going to look at Titus for. We are being conformed to this world. We've lost what Paul is instructing Titus to teach uh, to the churches in Crete. And so we've been affected by the world more than we care to admit or should be. And so this is really going to be a good season of purifying in the church of God. There's some powerful things that God will have for us in this epistle that we need to put in order. And for the one purpose that Titus, uh, Paul said to Titus, is so that they would see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. The name of God is at stake, and that's why we want to put these things in order to manifest His glory and beauty. And so this is a call to come out and be distinct and be separate from this world that we live in, to have a leadership who understands and promotes what we are going to look at this morning with Titus to be members who are giving ourselves to one another and passing on godliness to one another. It's going from generation to generation. We are to give our lives to each other that will keep the light of Christ shining. And I've said it before, there are two things that will last forever. There is God's Word and God's people. And so our calling is to take God's Word and to put it into God's people. And that's what Titus is going to kind of come back and bring back into the church at Crete. This is what will cause the world to take notice of the power of the gospel by the witness of the church. And so may we take to heart what God has for us in this epistle. And I want it to search us. I want us to come ready every Sunday, prepare your hearts and say, God, what do you have for me? I want to be changed in the book of Titus. Show me, do your work in my heart and in my life. With that, shall we go to the only one who can make these real and lasting changes in the midst of Southside Bible Church, the God of all grace. Let's go before his throne. Father, we come before the very throne of God and we come and we stand blameless with great joy. I thank you for the gospel. And I thank you for Titus. I thank you for Paul who has written this beautiful letter to pass on to his young protege. God, I I pray that we will learn from it. I ask that uh, you will uh, exposit the word, that you will guide and lead in the study and the teaching and preaching. And I pray that your spirit would attend and that this church would see truth and it would be changed and we would put in order what needs to be put in order in a day and age that is just darkening. God, let us be that city set on a hill. I pray, let every heart be purged and grow in the book of Titus. God, we look to your grace to do this marvelous work in our midst. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Titus. Turn with me to Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness and the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even His Word and the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This morning I want to take up those verses, or at least part one, of two. It's a long sentence I just read. There's not a period in it. Paul and Titus were very close friends and they're co-laborers. And so my question is, why such a formal, long introduction? Wouldn't you kind of expect them to just say, hey, Titus, here's what I'd like you to do? Like verse four, I, I kind of expected just that. 
Titus, my true child in the common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Why such a long introduction? Why so formal? Well, the churches are new in this region, and many think this is Paul's second to last letter that he wrote. Some even think it came after Acts 28. So Paul is now calling Titus to ordain leaders in every church. False teachers are sowing their falsities in this church, and they're going to surely come after Titus. They're going to attack him. He's in a very sticky situation. So Titus needs some very strong authority to do what Paul is asking him to do. And he gets his apostolic authority then from Paul. And Paul will establish his apostolic authority to these churches in this letter. His authority, Paul's, was given to him by Jesus Christ. Now he is delegating it to Titus leading in the church. And so this is really a document for Titus to lead the church in Crete. And what is cool is that this introduction gives us a true model of ministry. What we are going to see in four verses is what should be our model of ministry at Southside Bible Church and in your own lives. It's very empowering. This is a manual for leadership. It's better than any book I've ever read on leadership. Just these four verses, if we will get them, it's the essence of what a leader must be. So we live in a day of falling leadership. Seems like every day when I look at some form of social media, there's another pastor who has fallen and has been destroyed and done with ministry and hurt the church of God. Here is the insight into probably the greatest leader that the church has ever known in its existence after Jesus Christ, of course. Here is Paul, probably one of the greatest minds and hearts and the accomplishments of this man, of anyone who has ever lived after Jesus Christ. And he is now going to open up this morning and say, here's what drove me. Here's what made me the man I was. Here was why I was the leader that I was. So whenever Paul opens up his heart, it, it lets us to let us know, hey, what made him tick and why? Aren't you on pins and needles? I just, I love Paul. Tell me anything, Paul. I just want some clues. Open up your heart. I, I, I pray that you're ready to learn from this man. What, what made him such a powerful and effective leader to the church of God? And so for our outline, I want to look at the principles that made this man who he was. And I see five commitments so that a leader must be committed to these things, not just kind of half-hearted. These are commitments into what made Paul the great leader that he was. And the first one is he was committed to God's mastery over his life. Then he was committed to God's mission, and we'll look at that this morning. Next week, he was committed to God's message. He was committed to God's means. And I love this last point, he was committed to God's men. So let's take them up the next two weeks, those five commitments. And I want you just examining your own lives and hearts because this can make you a great leader as a mother, as just someone in a club, whatever it is. These are the essence of leadership. The first one is he was a man committed to God's mastery of his life. Look in verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of God. Do you, just Paul, that first word, do you realize this guy's credentials? He was trained under the very best of Gamaliel, Gamaliel and Judaism. He had a mind like no one else. He had a zeal for righteousness above all his peers. Jesus himself has to preach him the gospel. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament. His spiritual credentials are limitless. His accomplishments are endless. And his virtues are exemplary. At FIRE, we had the FIRE conference here. I was asked to introduce two of the speakers and as I would introduce, I would think through, what are the present attributes of this man that, ex that I could exalt that make you want to listen to what he's about to share on this subject? And I would get up and I would share the things that, were, were, that I saw that were just exemplary of these men, and here's why you should listen. And here's Paul's introduction that makes him great. You know, I, I really biffed it by what I shared about these men, because he just, I'm Paul, a bondservant. I'm a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Forget about Paul. The only thing that makes me great is the one that I'm in complete submission to. There is my introduction. I'm a slave. I am a slave. Paul was committed to God's absolute mastery over his life. When he was on the road to Damascus going to kill Christians... It's there that Jesus reveals his glory to him. And I love what he says. He says, who are thou, Lord? 
This is what anyone who called Jesus Lord, Paul wanted him to die. And now he finally realizes, who are, who are your Lord? Your God. And it was over for Paul. You're God and I'm not. My life is over. It's been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. My life is yours, oh God. I'm done with Paul. He died. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so you know what I see all too often today is leaders and people whose lives, are, they're not over. I, I see it all throughout the church. Your life is really not over. It's still your life. It's still about your dreams, your plans, your goals, your purposes with Jesus just added on. This, you will never be a good leader till you die. And so Paul, this is it. I died. That is why you can't be a good leader. You, why? Uh, why you will bear so little fruit for the kingdom of God is because it's still about you. It's still about how you look and your appearance and what people think. If, if it's still about you, you've missed it. This is not just a call for the great apostle. It's the call of everyone who wishes to follow after Jesus Christ that you'll take up your cross and die. There's, this is not an option in the Christian life. This is where it begins. I die. You're my God. And I want your mastery over my life. That's the essence of salvation. You now have mastery. How, how do you want to use me? Here I am, God, send me. My goal for life now is, is you, Jesus. I, I'm alive now to you, so my life is Christ. Is that how you look at your life? Is that how you think this morning in your seat? Has the Lord Jesus Christ done a takeover in your life? Because that is what made Paul. I am Paul, a doulos, a bond slave of God. And that is what makes a great leader. It is no longer about me. It's only about making much of King Jesus. There were two things that Paul was committed to then. A doulos. A doulos is one who serves without any regard for his own interests. It is just not what's going to make me happy. What's going to fix my 401k? What's going to give me a... It just, they're done with that. I, I serve without any regard for my own interest. Submission to God was at the heart of Paul's effectiveness. As he, he died that day. And the rest of his life, he just was after God. There's so many verses on this. I wanted to just show you. I, I just picked two of my favorite. And my first one is in Philippians 2.17. Paul says this, but, it, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering, that, that wine offering that was poured on top of the sacrifice, uh, I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. I, I just, my life is a, a sacrifice in serving to see your faith built up in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm just an offering. That's all I am now. I, I died. My life is given for the building up of your faith. It's just, it's not about Paul anymore. It's done. I just, I've given myself. This is my commission from God to give my life for the building up of your faith. And then in Acts 20, 24. <clears throat> but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I might finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And so Paul says, I'm going to this city. All I know is bonds and afflictions wait me. Why would you go? I, I don't consider my life as any dear account to myself. It, just, it doesn't matter. That doesn't even come into the equation. God says, go, and I go. I don't sit and say, is it, is it safe? I, I just go. What, whatever he says, if he says right now, go to Africa, I just go. I just, I, the questions about me, they're gone. I've died. I've been commissioned to God. Jesus says if you wish to save your life in this world, you're going to lose it. You'll lose it. If you lose your life for me, you're going to gain it. And so we're called to be slaves of God, and that's what made this man such a great leader. I'm a slave. My will is gone. My will is his. And the other thing is he's an apostolos of Jesus Christ, which is an apostle. The word means messenger. And it's, when we hear that word, many of us think, man, that is a lofty term, and it really isn't. Uh, it, it referred to a slave. 
And so if you said to a slave, I want you to take this and go across town and take this message to this person, you are called an apostle. You are a messenger. So you'll take that message. The dignity of an apostle was the one who sent the messenger. And in Paul's case, it was Jesus Christ. I'm a messenger, but I am a messenger of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And so an apostle is a slave with a task who has been sent by Jesus Christ. I'm a slave of God. I'm sent by Christ with a message. I have a message, and I've been sent by Jesus, the gospel. I've been commissioned by Christ. I'm his ambassador. And so please see what made this man such an amazing leader and powerful tool in the hand of God is my life is dead. It's hid with God and Christ Jesus. I'm his messenger, and that is the only way to describe me. I'm committed to God's mastery over my life. Have thine own way, Lord. And so a great leader is one who's committed to God's mastery in his life. Secondly, I'm a man committed to God's mission. I'm a man committed to God's mission uh, for the faith of those chosen of God. So there are kind of a three-pronged mission that uh, Paul is giving Titus here. The first is for the faith of those chosen of God. And we're going to call that the evangelization of the world. For the faith of those chosen of God. Secondly, for the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. We're going to call that edification. And then for the hope of eternal life. And I'm going to call that encouragement, that in all of your sufferings, I'm going to keep encouraging you that you have the hope of eternal life. This is not your home. And so there's three things that you're devoted to. Paul says, I've been given a mission to evangelize to edify and build up the church of God and to encourage it with the hope of glory. These are the three things that every church then should be committed and devoted and every one of us should be committed and devoted in our outworking of our lives. Please don't miss this. This commitment is the same for Paul, it's the same for ministers today, and it's the same for every believer. We take up this great commission, we come together as one, and we are devoted to evangelism, edification, and encouragement that will end in the worship of God. Look with me at the first prong. We're going to try to get through those prongs today, and then we'll come back next week, Lord willing. So in verse 2, or verse 1, for the faith of those who are chosen of God. Paul says, I labor to bring God's elect unto saving faith. You have some mammoth doctrines here in just one statement. You have the balance of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. I think it was R.C. Sproul said, if you can find someone who can tie that together and write a book, he'll be a millionaire because everyone will buy it. it. It's not the easiest subject to tie it together. It's really big. And so I don't want to get lost in the details. I think I attempted it in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done, if you want to go back and listen to that. So I don't want to get too lost in the details and lose what Paul is doing here. So I'm going to try and make this clear and simple And I hope it'll be clearer than mud by the time I'm done. So we we have the storyline of the Bible. And what you see in the storyline is God selecting people out who were not His own, and they're called chosen. Chosen of God. They're called the elect of God. God calls Abraham out. Abraham is an idolater, a worshiper of stars. And God just calls him out and says, You're through your seed, I am going to bless the nations. They are going to be blessed through the seed that will come through you, Abraham. Then in Deuteronomy 7, 6, the nation of Israel comes from that. And he says, You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you, Israel, to be a people for His own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So I chose you out. It wasn't because you were smarter or better. It was my good pleasure, and I chose you out as a nation to be my people to advance this kingdom, the, the gospel that would come forth in Jesus Christ. And then we see as we keep moving through the storyline in Romans 8 through 9 that this election continues to carry through. And God has a chosen people for Himself from all the nations. And he says, I'm going to gather a bride together from every nation, and I'm going to choose them out, and I'm going to make them holy, and I'm going to present them to my son on the last day as a bride. I'm going to give my son that church, that spotless bride at the end. And we are told that all of this happened before the foundation of the world, that 
God made these eternal decrees in his choosing of who these people would be before he created anything. You were already in the heart of God. And so the question arises, if God has chosen the elect before the foundation of the world, what is the point of us doing anything? Why go preach? Why preach this message, Paul, if God already has his elect? Yet God has decreed the means as well as the ends. And so God has decreed his people and he's decreed how he will bring them into his kingdom. And his decree is through the preaching of the gospel and that they would believe. So the means are very important, not just the ends. And so there is a way that God has decreed how he will gather his elect into the fold of God to be that bride on the last day. And he uses a means called preaching. He uses a means called preaching the truth. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of his son and what he has accomplished and will. And so Paul understood this so well. That God has his chosen ones from every tribe, tongue, and nation. But the way that they will enter in is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. How can they believe in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can there be a preacher unless they are sent? Paul says, I'm a slave and I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ to preach the gospel to every soul possible that the chosen of God will hear it and believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I'm given to this. 2 Timothy 2, 9 through 10 Paul says, I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. And for this reason, I endure all things. And that all things is big. Paul endured much. I endure it all. Why do you do this, Paul? For the sake of those who are chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. I keep suffering. I get beat to a pulp. I just keep preaching this for the elect, that they will believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be brought into this salvation and this eternal glory. So my life is for the sake of the elect to bring them into faith. Who are the elect? I don't know. I know after, I know once they believe who they are, but I don't, before they believe, I don't know And that's why I quoted every time, and I'll do it again, Charles Spurgeon. Sean already did it twice in Sunday school. He paved the way. Uh, Spurgeon said this, if I knew, if if every elect person had a yellow E on his back, I'd run in London lifting up every shirt to see who had it. But because they don't, I lift up the crucified one, and I call all men to come and to believe, and the elect will come, and they will believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will go and I will lift up the name above every name, saying, believe, believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul got this so well. They're they're chosen. Paul, was Paul seeking God? His testimony was pretty easy. He was going to kill Christians, and Jesus appears on the road to Damascus and reveals himself to him. Paul never patted himself on the back and just said, I was so smart, I figured it out on my own. There was no problem for Paul with the doctrine of election. God smashed me on that road and revealed his glory to me. He gets all the glory. I will boast in the name of Jesus Christ alone. He knew that God's plan was one that he was a slave to, and he was to bring the elect to faith by the means of, of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so guys, I evangelize because God uses it to give life to his chosen ones. If there, uh, if there was no election, what would be the hope? So get this, if, if there was an election, I would spend all of my days, according to Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, preaching to corpses. He says they're spiritually dead when they come into the world. Have you ever tried to share the gospel with a corpse? Like, you can be so persuasive and wise and good in your arguments, and they don't ever respond. And you can do it for months and years. But praise be to God that though you were dead in your trespasses and sins, He made us alive together with Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, your faith. It's the gift of God so that no one can ever boast. 
And so here, here it is, is, if there was an election, there's no hope of preaching to corpses, but because there's a God who takes the gospel and gives life and they believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am so confident to walk into any setting, prisons, streets, it just, there's no place I can't go that I know that if they're, not, if they're elect, they're going to believe this gospel. I can go to lands where they've never even heard of Jesus Christ, and with election, they could believe upon the name of Christ. So this is so empowering, and this is what empowered Paul, one of his prongs. I minister, I labor to bring people, God's chosen ones, to faith in Jesus Christ. So get out there. God has his chosen ones, and most likely they are around you on a daily basis. You keep sowing. God made a divine choice of them in eternity past, and he activates it in time by personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes about by our lives and our preaching the gospel to them. I think one of my greatest joys in ministry is anytime you see a soul come to faith and believe and cross over from death to life, there's no greater joy that you can uh, feel. That is what made Paul such an amazing leader. So let's give our lives to activate faith. Amen? Give our lives to activate faith. The most common weakness in Reformed churches is personal evangelism. And I just, I just pray, do you have any? If you, if you can sit here and, and you've just, you have none because you're ice, you're cold, you don't want to talk, you'd rather share the gospel with everyone in the church. And I just want you to really wrestle right now, if this is the means that Paul was committed to, am I committed to this? Am I really committed to get in to this, this world and love them with this gospel that God would activate faith in his chosen ones? So this was a man, our first point, I went a little long, committed to God's mission. I'm going to pick it up. Second point is, is that uh, he did it for the faith of those who were chosen of God, this mission. And then the second thing he says is, I do it for the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. So I'm devoted to evangelism for the elect to come to faith. And the other thing is I'm devoted to the, that the, they have the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness, which will produce godliness from truth. This is what we call edification. So I'm devoted to teaching God's Word because that is what renews the mind and that's what's going to bring about a life of godliness, he's saying. The Greek word for knowledge, we've looked at it many times, epigenosis. It means this full knowledge, rich, deep, thorough knowledge. I said it means to get it. It's no longer just data. I get it. I see it, I behold it, it becomes mine, it's, it's rich, it's experiential knowledge. It's not just I know a bunch of facts and doctrines, but in those I get it, I see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's the full knowledge. This is the truth of God's word and his gospel and you get it. And it brings about, this is how you know if you get it, it brings about trust. And I trust it and I trust him. And he's saying when that faith comes about and that first commitment What now comes out is a trust that brings about godliness, and you'll start living like children of God and trusting Him and being separate and set apart in this world. And so what we see in Scripture with this phrase, the knowledge of the truth, sometimes it can mean salvation, like in 1 Timothy 2.4, I won't read it, but here it's the knowledge of the truth that brings godliness. This is not uh, initial salvation. This is what Sean was teaching on. This is the sanctifying truth of God. So this is the the knowledge of the truth is I'm learning God's Word as a believer, and it's growing, and it's renewing my mind, and it's producing now godliness. Godliness. You know what we want to do today is we want to skip the knowledge of the truth, and I just want to feel it, and I just want to wake up godly. I want to sing a song that makes me cry, and I'll be godly, and I'm telling you that will never produce godliness. It's going to be this commitment to the knowledge, the full knowledge of the truth of God's Word. That will produce godliness. <clears throat> Turn to Titus 2.11. I want to show you a picture of what I think Paul, Titus, Paul's writing to Titus here. And we'll study this in a few months. For the grace of God, in verse 11, has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us. So now this is what Paul's talking about right here now. This is what salvation comes. Here's what it does. It instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires 
and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age. So that's how we're going to live. That's what this is, grace is going to do. And as we do it, we're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, which is our third prong. And four, verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, <coughs> zealous for good deeds. The knowledge of the truth, the grace of God, as I keep growing and learning it, the grace of God is going to be conforming me to be a person zealous for good deeds, denying ungodliness and worldly desires. It's going to be changing me from one image of glory to the next. And so my first task is evangelization, which we call justification. When you believe, you're declared not guilty, you're right before God, you're saved. And then the teaching of the Word of God now through His Holy Spirit is it brings about sanctification where I am being sanctified, I'm being cleansed, I'm being purified, I'm growing into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the process of every believer. And then next week it ends in glorification, which is the hope of glory when I'm finally going to be made perfect and have no more sin. So there's the whole commitment, justification, sanctification, reminding each other that glorification's coming even though I still battle and fight with sin here on a daily basis. And so I just want you to get this. The, the millennial age, the millennial age is so much emotionalism. And you just want to feel God and you want emotional responses. This generation is losing truth. And I want young men, youth kids in college and over, I just, who are committed to truth, Grab it, hold it, preach it, learn it, proclaim it. We'll look at this more next week. But this is it, truth. Paul was committed to teaching the truth of God's Word. He was devoted to it. He was a slave to it. In Acts 20, he told the church, I did not shrink back from teaching you the whole, full counsel of God. I did it day and night. I was entreating you both day and night. I kept teaching you truth, God's Word, begging you, imploring you to live it. I would never grow weary of the means that God has given His Word, and I just keep teaching it in every setting I go into. It's it. The truth is the only thing that will transform you into the image of Christ. He says to Timothy in the book earlier, therefore preach the Word of God in season and out of season. It's the only thing that's going to change us into godliness. So be devoted, Timothy, preaching this word in every setting. This is what grows you. This is what renews your mind and transforms you into godliness. This is the way that we grow up spiritually. Jesus said, teach them all things that I taught you. Go teach them. I just want to wake up one day and be conformed to godliness while I'm on my cell phone while I'm on my Xbox, I just want to wake up and be holy. That'll never happen. This is going to be, holiness is a journey with very deliberate steps. And Paul is saying it is learning this word, getting in, growing, renewing your mind, fighting for it, memorizing it, having it preached to you by friends, family. It, it is a commitment. Paul says, I was devoted to this word. We are committed to the Word of God at this church. We teach it to our kids, our youth, our adult Sunday schools, community groups, church service. It is, I, I have nothing else to give you but the Word of God. And that is why it's not emotionalism. It's not friendships that are going to do it. It's this Word of God dwelling in you richly. Are you committed to this at all cost? Are you digging in and learning it? With the end goal, give me epigenosis. I want to know God. I am not happy just learning. I want to know God. Abide in me and I in you. Are you putting God's word into God's people? And Titus is going to say, by way of discipleship, one-on-one -on -one relationships, on your own, corporate settings, neighborhoods. That is what Paul was committed to. You couldn't move him away from it. He would die to not preach this word. And so there's going to be a little more next week that will bring it all together. I'm just going to throw this point out now and I'll flesh it out more next week. The third point of the prong that he was committed to was in the hope of eternal life. And that is glorification and that is the encouragement. And so 
what Paul kept doing in his teaching of the word is that this word promises eternal life for those who believe. For those who hold to Christ to the very end, the reward is, is him. The reward is glory forever. And so we, we, we can't lose the hope. And so here we have no lasting city and we keep trying to put our tent stakes down and we've got to keep teaching and preaching God's word to each other that this isn't it. So remember Paul, I said he didn't have any hopes, plans, or dreams of his own. I mean, he, he's thinking of this city whose builder and maker is God. And so we've got to become a, a people where in this word we're teaching and we're committed that it's not just how to make this life easier, but it's how to endure hardships and difficulties in a generation that's going to come against us now. And how do we endure it but without this hope of, of glory? I suffer now and I, I receive everything. Everything I endure in this life will not match the reward. The reward is so much better than the cost. And so we got to keep fighting and reminding one another of what our hope really is. It's not just that I'm going to wake up happy tomorrow. My, my hope is that I'm going to wake up in Jesus' arms one day. And it's, it's certain. I love the certainty of the sovereignty of God is if you have faith, he will bring you to that day. So our, our human responsibility is I persevere and I fight, but God will lose none of his own. He'll bring me there. So I just, I pray that you have the hope of eternal life. So the Christianity has been being sold for what you get here and now. And I just, I, I, Paul could not get away that I'm so committed to the hope of eternal life. And I want us to be a church that holds to that and looks to that. My, my hope isn't my little kid getting into college. My, my hope is my little kid getting into the kingdom of God. And I just, I want to get caught up and the eternal things and quit listening to all the temporal things that are being thrown at us. And so those are the three things that Paul was absolutely committed and devoted to. Is he was a man under, under surrender to God and he was a man committed to God's mission. And that was the evangelization, that was edification, and that was this encouragement of our eternal hope. So let's close out. A couple thoughts and then we'll pray. Is your life still about your plans, your goals, and your dreams and accomplishments? I really want you to not leave without at least dealing with that. Is it still about all your stuff, or is my, my hope Jesus Christ and his kingdom and his plan? Is it, is it about slavery to God, coming under his plans, his goals, his dreams, what he wants to accomplish for you? Have you come under that? And so the question is just honestly, are you a slave? Are you, are you really a slave to God? Dads, are you, are you a slave? Moms, this is where it begins in the home is I'm a slave to God and, and, and I give myself to the training of these little ones. And husbands who I'm a slave to, to love my wife like Christ loved the church and I'm a slave to bring all of my gifts as a wife unto my husband for the good of our family. And so just, I just really ask you, are you a slave to God? Do you see the means that God uses to bring His chosen ones into the kingdom? He, he uses truth so that they can believe. And how are they going to believe unless we sow the truth? And so are, are you devoted to bringing truth to bear in this godless world that can't think right about God? Are you committed to that? They need truth, not just songs that make them feel happy. Do you have a prayer list of those you are seeking to share the truth with so God can create faith in them? Or is your theology, I don't want to get near unbelievers, they might stain me, so I just stay away from them. <laughs> I pray that I've broken that down over the years. If I haven't, come see me, please. Share the gospel. Who are you praying for? Who are you laboring with? Are you getting the truth poured into you? Are you a real student of God's word or do you just play at it? Who are you pouring all the truth that you are learning into as he will drive in this book? Are you pouring it into someone? This takes investment. Is the truth you are learning conforming you to godliness or are you just smarter? Getting smarter won't solve it. Is the truth, is it epigenosis? And the way you'll know, is, is it making me godly? Is it changing me, my behaviors and what I do and how I think and how I love? Is it conforming you to godliness? Are you given to the devices of our time, persuasion, manipulation, emotionalism? 
Or do you depend on the bare word of God alone, trusting it to conform people to godliness? I get, I get new, new thoughts almost every week from someone of how we could grow better. And I'm just telling you, I'm not going to move away from the word of God. If you have a suggestion that's not the word of God, I don't want to hear it. I, I will not be moved away because God says this is the only thing that will do it. Will you let the Word of God put in order anything that is out of order in your life in the book of Titus? And so I'm asking if you'll let Titus have its way in your heart as we study and work through this. Do you see what made Paul the great leader he was? I mean, it's just unbelievable. Just, I want to be enslaved to God, and I'll do whatever he wants. And the way I'm going to do it is by sharing the gospel, using truth to build people up, and using truth to remind us of our eternal hope that's going to come at the end of this. I pray that we are all committed and devoted to that as moms, dads, everything that we do, that that is it. That's our goal. To God be the glory. Father, I thank you for Paul writing these words to Titus. I thank you for the depth of them, and even as we'll finish next week, seeing what made this man such an incredible leader. I pray that you would do that in all of our lives, Lord. We want to be leaders for the kingdom of God. We want to, to lead others into these truths. We want to see the, the chosen come to faith. We want to see those in the body of Christ built up into the image of Christ. And we want to do this as we never lose sight of the hope that's coming. And God, we have a hope right now that Jesus could come back today. God, I pray it would be so. I pray, Jesus, come back even this day consummate, finish, redeem this earth completely. We look for that. Remove the curse of, uh, of our bodies decaying in a world that's falling apart. Lord, we long for the new heavens and the new earth where you will be seated and we will dwell and look at you and behold your face and we will worship you forever. And so, God, I thank you for this blessed hope of glory. I thank you, minister to us these days through the book of Titus. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.